Are we missing Mr. Crandall? We are. We are. Okay. And I'm, Mr. Crandall called. to call this meeting to order. Someone move it? Move it. Or no, there is no move. Excuse okay. me, my bad. I'm just okay. calling it to order. I need someone to move item 1.02 to approve the agenda. And before we do that, are there any additions or corrections to this agenda? Yes, there is. Um, <clears throat> section 5.04 with respect to the, um, the uh, Rev Theater Company. I'd like to have that uh, tabled. In fact, I did some more research on this. I wanna meet with our principals and have some discussion on this one. It is a big ticket item. However, um, it is covered by the COSER. What I wanna do is I wanna look into, um, into that and also wanna to talk to the principals. It, this is where the theater company used to come in. So um, obviously wouldn't be able to do that. It would all be done remotely and via um, video. So I wanna meet with the principals also we do not have a contract with them. They terminated the contract themselves. Uh, we had signed in February, and therefore we did not renew with them in July as of yet. We can if we want to. I spoke with them today. So right now there is actually no contract to terminate because we did not follow through. So I'd like this tabled this evening. I'd like to have a little we'll bit more because forward, obviously Mark. I'd like to take a look at all the enrichment that we're doing for our kids. Yep, you're just gonna pull it, Brian. Thank you. Okay, all right. Um, any other additions or corrections? If not, would someone move this item 1.02? Move it. Second. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Mrs. Perry, I'm a yes. Mrs. Elbegore? Yes. Mr. Cordone? Yes. Mrs. Cooper? Yes. Mrs. Lyons? Yes. Mr. DeGelorme? Yes. Um, this brings me to my public forum announcement. If anyone wishes to make a comment to the board or has a question, you may email us. Um, you may go to our website and find the clerk email, or it is clerk at Wilson. I'm going to do this wrong. Dot C-N-Y-R-I-C dot org. Um, item 1.04, please. Move, Move it. it. Second. Any discussion? Mrs. Perry, I'm a yes. Mrs. Cooper? Yes. Mr. Cordon? Yes. Mrs. Lyons? Yes. Mr. DeGelorme? Yes. And Mrs. Elbegore? Yes. Item 1.05, please. Move it. Second. Discussion? Mrs. Perry, I'm a yes. <clears throat> Mrs. Cooper? I'm a yes. Mr. Cordon? Yes. Mrs. Lyons? Yes. Mrs. Excuse me, Mr. DeGelorme? Yes. Mrs. Alvagore? Yes. Um, any questions about the October, upcoming October 13th meeting? Okay, the NISBA virtual convention. Uh, you should have received a paper copy of the resolutions booklet. And um, I believe we will have, if we don't have it already, Mrs. Perry, I don't know if it's ready, the um, online response. It's in the works. Okay, you'll be getting that soon. Yeah. So you can respond online like we did uh, last year. Um, I want to take a moment and remind anyone that's watching, um, it is uh, it's still an opportunity to complete the census. And if you haven't, please do so. And we're reaching out and asking you to remind anyone that you know, um, ask them if they've completed it, and please encourage folks to complete it. It means a lot to our community uh, for many different reasons. The, that count being accurate is in the best interest of our greater community for many things besides our school district. 
Um, I want to share with you that there is a work order in to our IT department based on some feedback and questions. Um, it appears that we're going to be able to um, add everyone, every board member, I should say, will be added to the clerk email. So there will be no sharing anymore. It'll come directly to each one of us, which I am grateful for. Um, now it will come directly and there's no middle person having to share it out to you folks, but I don't know what day that will start. So when, when we find out, I will let you know when it's actually in service, but there is a work order and it can, apparently can be done. Um, up till this point, anything that I have received has been shared directly with each of you. I didn't read, I sent it out first. Um, that was uh, a priority. And I was the backup person, just in case. There's a lot going on and our clerk is busy. So I was trying to be a backup person to try to keep it timely. And Robin, uh, I want to thank you for that because I know that when we all probably get a lot of email and it's hard to keep track of everything that comes in. So I'm glad that we're, we're trying to streamline that. Thank you. Um, you're welcome. I mean, uh, you know, we'll, uh, hey, it works for me. <laughs> It works for me. It's one. It's one less worry about making sure that um, it's timely. That's always a concern. And I had one other item. I and now it's escaped me. Uh, hmm. Well, if I think of it, I'll bring it up later. I had one other thing I was going to speak to, and I've lost it. So I'm just going to turn it over to Mr. Polvino for his report for this evening. Sorry about that. They were starting to clean my, my office out there. <laughs> they were starting to mop, so I had to shut the door. Good evening, everyone. Uh, we're going to start off um, with a reopening update. Uh, Mr. Carroll, if you could just put that PowerPoint up, please. Um, first, I'd like to say I just need to extend um, my appreciation to the staff and students. Obviously, our first day and our families, our first day was the 8th. And, and that was also, uh, you know, that was just a, a staff day and we had um, our board meeting that evening. So this is actually the first board meeting um, that has been established since. And I will tell you, I had the opportunity to, to visit buildings last week. Um, and I actually visited two schools today. I went over to Volney and I went over to Granby. And it was absolutely amazing. The comments um, that were made were just that the kids were being just so supportive of, of the reopening plan and the staff as well and the parents. Um, if you've been here at the junior high in the morning, um, watching the drop off has been absolutely um, fantastic. It's been smooth sailing. I mean, we've improved every day in every, um, at every site. Um, and that's a testament to our staff. I think also the reopening plan, which has been the, 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 the focus of everything that we have done. Um, to at the beginning we started back in july we've been working on these plans obviously well before that we worked through some things in the summer early summer and learned some things and then july uh 13th we got the guidance from NYSED and the department of health those items came out we turned our plan in our emphasis for everything that we've been doing has been to do an excellent job with our implementation a plan is only as good as its implementation and I believe that our team, which involved hundreds of people um, and continues with thousands of people because everybody, one of the key terms in the Department of Health guidance, every one of the assurance starts off the responsible person will. Well, it starts off and it says the superintendent's the responsible person um, for all of those insurances and then their designees. I believe that to make our, our, our Fulton um, team strong and everybody here is Fulton strong means every single person in our community, our families, our kids, our parents, our staff, our, our faculty, our administrators, our superintendent, everybody, our board members, everybody is a responsible person. And, you know, everyone, if we take care of one another, we're going to be very successful with our reopening plan. Are there going to be moments? Yeah, there's going to be moments. And I think, but one of the things that I, I think is outstanding here is, is that we're bringing over 2,100 students into this district on a weekly basis. We have just over a thousand kids, which you'll hear about in a few minutes, um, that are on full remote learning. So we're writing right around 68% to 32%. Um, and so I, I think that that's an important piece to know that, you know, that's something that we heard loud and clear from our community that we needed to have a sound plan. And I believe our plan um, does hit on all those cylinders, but a plan is only as good as the piece of paper that it's written on. 
and that's why everything we've done is try to to implement it with fidelity to the to, to the best of our ability and obviously some of the things that we planned are things that um, we thought would work we've made adjustments um, we're watching very closely that's one of the reasons why I'm walking through buildings we find areas where we can improve where we can tighten things up if we hear things or see things that we're not seeing we've been addressing them um, as quickly as possible and that's the way we can keep us going in the right direction because this lift is huge um, and I think that's one of the reasons why we are going to be successful is because we've built that. And when I saw from kindergarten all the way through pre-K, actually through 12th graders, um, over the course of the last couple of weeks, um, everybody is, is really following our expectations. And with that, we can say um, that we've done to the best of our ability. So each and every day is a new day that we're focusing on improvement. So with that, Dan, can you take me to the front there, please? Next slide. Thank you. So one of the things that we've had, these are our enrollments. And I think this is a piece that's um, really important to see. Uh, as you can see, we put percentages on the online only and the hybrid. So hybrid means that these are kids that are coming in person. Online is uh, students that are remote only. And you can see that we moved from around somewhere between 26 to 28 percent, 25 to 28 percent. Uh, in early August to mid-August uh, when we made some adjustments into the latter part of August. I think the first week of school, I think there were families that, that did come out and, and were concerned about um, family issues. I know that uh, my team has talked to parents and every one of them was related in, in what they were explaining why they wanted to move to remote was really related to exposure issues and concerns about could be family members directly or extended families members that may be providing um, child care. So that number has creeped up a little bit. Um, we didn't have students move in um, because we kind of limited that to try to limit the space. And we're going to be reevaluating that at about the seventh week. Um, but as you can see, that number has increased. And therefore, um, we did dedicate teachers to, and um, we're able to do that. Right now, our classrooms for remote are riding upwards of 25, in some cases, 26. We're monitoring those very closely. We, may, we are making some internal adjustments um, on Teams uh, as well to address some of our remote pieces. Um, and what we'll do is probably around the sixth to seventh week, we'll reach out and get an idea of what families are thinking for that second 10 weeks as we had indicated this summer. So as you can see, we're riding pretty consistently, uh, which is interesting, um, at 31% from the pre-K and then you go all the way to ninth through 12 and you're riding at 31%. And you can see your totals on the right hand side. Um, and those are our total enrollments. We tried to get away from having multiple slides, which I know were very difficult to follow. So you can actually see the grade bands. So you go left to right, you'll see the number of the grade band, you'll see the kids that are in hybrid, you'll see the number of students um, online, and then the total number of students. Uh, so for example, K-5, 959 hybrid, in other words, kids that are coming into school, 458 that are remote only for a total of 1,417. And you can read those, I'm not gonna read each line. And then you'll see at the bottom, our totals are just, as I said, a little over 2,100, actually 2,200 uh, students are in hybrid, 2,238 and 1,035 or 32% or for a total right now, pre-K 12 of enrollment of 3,273. Ryan. So, yes, sir. I was just gonna say, can you, can you address it on? Um, what is the, um, the I guess, the, the proportion of synchronous to asynchronous learning opportunities that a hybrid student would receive versus um, a student who's learning remotely, online only? What, what does that look like, synchronous versus asynchronous for a kid, that a, a student that is going through their week in our district? So I'm going to have Dan Carroll pop on there in a minute. I know what I can say is that elementary, obviously, we have the synchronous learning going on the four days a week. And the fifth day, um, we have our Mondays, which I can have Mr. Carroll speak to. And I'm actually, he met with all the, he's met with the different grade level bands. So instead of me trying to, to work through, I'm going to ask Dan to, to speak to that. Mr. Mr. Carroll? Thank you. What is the, oops, there's, somebody, there's something raspy. I'm not sure what's going on. Dan, can you turn yours off? Maybe you're the. Just 
Carol, if you try muting your screen, let's give that a shot. Ms. Carol, you're going to have to uh, log out and log back in with the uh, presentation. I think that's what the issue is at this point. There we go. Okay. Why don't I speak to Mr. Carroll? Why don't you turn that off there, please? You have to love technology when it works really well for us. Let's see here. Dan, can you turn off your microphone, please? Is it more code, maybe? I think you're best off turning it off, please. Mr. Carroll, can you just turn yours off, please? Thank you. <laughs> Set Mr. Lacey down there to, to do that. Um, to answer your question, um, now that I'm off target a little bit, um, the, the, I'm going to have Mr. Carroll, when he gets back on there, we actually have a slide that goes over that, Mr. Cordone. I can have him show that later in the presentation because when he gets back on, what we have is we have a teacher and a and a student side of the of the um, of the template, and we can show that to you. So as soon as he gets on there, because I don't have that one in my possession right in front of me, but I can have him go on with that. If and you what can, I'll do is is that okay with you, Mr. Cordon? Yeah, I just I'm especially concerned as I have students at the high school level where they may have labs with science courses and. You know, is yep. it differentiated course to course with those extra pieces to it? I'm just trying to, as a parent, wrap my mind around, um, you know, what my, my own students should be doing. And I'm, I'm sure that other parents have the very same question. Yeah, we had a we had a great conversation. That was a great question that you provided me. Um, and we had a good conversation about that today. So we anticipated the question, uh, but unfortunately, I can't just get on there right now to, to have that go up there. Um, I'm going to see if I can get our presentation up here now. Of course, I hadn't pulled it up here. Mr. Lisi, are you back on yet? I am. I'm going to try and pull up the presentation can for you. Can you pull up the presentation for me, please? Because I like to see everybody when I'm talking, so I apologize. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Mr. Carroll, um, when when we move forward, I want you to, you know, the slide you were sharing with me that compared student day versus the uh, staff day or the student versus the staff day. Sure. Yeah. Mr. Lisi. I'm working on I'm it. I'm going to have him present that slide now since we're there. I don't want to wait if that's okay with you, Mr. Lisi. So be on hold. Mr. Carroll, can you pull up the slide and please discuss synchronous versus the asynchronous days, please? Sure, uh, I apologize for that, some microphone issues. Um, in response to Mr. Cardone's question, the proportion for an in-person student versus, I'm sorry, a hybrid student versus an online only student uh, would be the same. And that's because our online only students are in online specific sections, okay? So their schedule mirrors uh, the schedule of a student who's with us in person some of the time in our hybrid model. So for example, if you're a GRB student and you're an online only student, you have online only sections of all of your classes. Okay, so in that way, that proportion of synchronous to asynchronous is going to be the same um, for either of those students. And can you share what that is? Is it, I mean, their schedule is different on the two days the hybrid students are at G. Ray Bodley. So it's really one day a week synchronous. Is that right? Am I, am I understanding that correctly? So for the G. Ray Bodley student, they've got the two days yeah. in person. If, if they're the same, both the hybrid and those that are learning remotely or at home online, 
Um, are we saying then that that a student that goes to school on Tuesday, Tuesday, Wednesday, their yeah. schedules are different on both of those days? So they're they're really they're not in in class twice over those two days, or are they? Is there is their schedule different each day that they're they're at the high school, or is it the same exact schedule both days that those hybrid they, kids are in? They have the same schedule now. The Tuesday Wednesday student has the same schedule both days, and the Thursday Friday. So that means, as I'm, if I'm understanding you correctly, then the student learning online that is in their section would have they would be virtually part of that classroom to get the they, synchronous learning. And then there's an asynchronous, the asynchronous piece comes on Thursday, Friday for them. Correct. But and they, Monday and Monday. Right. Um, but those, those students um, for get with the example of the Tuesday, Wednesday student, if I'm an online only student, my schedule is with exclusively online only classmates. Okay, we get we intentionally scheduled online only sections to ensure that teachers could focus um, on the students in that single environment. So that okay. they wouldn't have to try to juggle between uh, engaging the students in the classroom physically with them and also being able to address students in the online environment. And so I just want to clarify for my understanding then. So using that Tuesday, Wednesday student example, um, irregardless of whether they are learning online or they are learning in the hybrid, they are, they are um, receiving synchronous learning those two days and then asynchronous learning on Monday, Thursday, Friday. Right. In all of their classes? Yes. I want to, Mr. Cordon, I want to verify that for the uh, the electives. I, I do want to verify that. This is one of those nights where I miss, uh, wish Ms. Parkhurst was on here. This is one of those meetings where, uh, you know, you don't know who we need to have on online. So um, I can get clarification with that because I know there was, there may be a concern if a student's taking two electives on the same day, Mr. Cordon. We can, we can confirm that. I want to make sure I, we provide accurate information to our community. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thanks for uh, um, indulging me. <laughs> yeah, it was a great question because I think it's one that many are having and I think it's one that's growing. This is an area where um, we're getting better and better. We're in a better place than we were obviously in the spring, but I think we're all trying to find our way through and our teachers are getting better and better by the day. Um, our Monday um, piece is also getting stronger. I know that Mr. Uh, uh, Carroll met with the secondary teachers this afternoon. I couldn't get over that. He was meeting with the chairs, I believe. Uh, was that the case? Can you you want to comment at all on our Mondays? Because I know that was one of the questions I asked you, Mr. Carroll. Uh, sure. So Mondays are, um, in the words of one of our chairs today, the busiest day from the teacher standpoint. This is a day that mixes um, individual outreach to all GRB students. The goal is for every every GRB student to. Um, have been contacted in an individual Google Meet uh, with their guided teacher. Guided is the updated version of guided study hall. Um, the goal with guided is really to be the, the home of that social emotional support. Guided teachers are the point people for helping to direct students, particularly on those asynchronous days, to direct students to the support they need from um, one of their teachers. So they, they start their day with um, an hour of, or I should say 40 minutes. Of, actually, why don't I pull up, Don, would you mind stopping your share and I can pull up our document yeah. from the chairs? Sure. Would the board like Ms. Parkhurst to join or would you like her to present at the next meeting? She just texted, normally I don't pay attention to my phone, but would you prefer, we can do an update for you and then do a presentation at the next mm -hmm. meeting. What would you prefer as a board? Can we just have her join so that we can just kind of discuss it right now while we are already talking about it? Ms. Geithner, can you please facilitate that? Thank you. Yes, I will.
And Dan, are you going to put your screen up? Is that what you're? And if you could make it a little bigger, please. There you go. Thank you. And I'm wondering why we are waiting for Mrs. Parker's, um, Mr. Palvino, if it, if everybody, all of my colleagues do, and I'm not disrespecting anyone, understand the difference between the synchronous and the asynchronous learning. Um, Cause I think it's key, even if our colleagues know, maybe the public doesn't know that might be watching. I wonder sure. if watching. Yeah. yeah, could you cover that and just describe our asynchronous and synchronous, Mr. Carroll? I, and Ms. Parkers, thank you for joining us. I uh, appreciate you were watching and uh, texted in. I normally don't pay attention to that during the meeting, but uh, when I heard, I saw your name flash on there, I was appreciative. So thank you uh, as well. If you could uh, share any um, information that would help our board and community get a, more clarity. Sure. I, oh my God, what have I done here? Okay. Oh, darn. Can you hear me? Yes. All right, very yes, good. Hi, everybody. Um, students, who, students who come to the high school in person receive obviously uh, the in-person instruction in their four core classes plus one elective plus they go to their guided class they're guided where they we focus on social emotional learning and they eat lunch on their asynchronous days they are not receiving synchronous instruction it's those other three days uh, monday Thursday, Friday is all asynchronous learning, okay? Students who are virtual 100% uh, at, at home 100% of the time receive the same as the in-person students. They, they receive um, direct synchronous lessons, as Mr. Carroll said, just that group of students with the teacher in their four core classes and they're guided. All of our electives are, are asynchronous. Does that answer, Mr. Cordon? Yeah, it, it does help me. And I, I'm just wondering for students, when do they get that direct contact, whether it's a office hour, whether it's, you know, um, them needing extra help, checking in with a particular teacher then, if they're only asynchronous, um, and even for those three days when they aren't synchronous for the other courses that they're taking, what are the opportunities that students have so parents are aware um, that, that, you know, there's a plan for them to be connected with their teacher if they need it? Sure. Um, all of our students um, receive an individual uh, check-in by their guided teacher on Mondays. So the teachers spend upwards of about an hour and a half on Mondays reaching out to each of their students for the most part our guided teachers have um, 15 students so at that point the guided teacher checks in with each student um, to talk about progress in each of their classes okay so the individual teachers um, they do have uh, we call it meets within the master schedule it's labeled as meets time um, they have it, it looks a little different depending on which department it is um, but they have carved out time in their schedules um, to to be available for students. Um, back to Mondays, teachers are available um, for about an hour in the morning and every Monday afternoon from 1.30 until 2.30, um, where kids would be able to get immediate, um, uh, I guess a, an immediate response from a teacher on Monday afternoon. Um, we are working in guided um, with our students for them to advocate um, to reach out where obviously the guided teacher is keep, you know, keeping a watch on each of the students um, when they reach out to teachers. And, and just in our first week, um, really our kids are, are engaging much better than they did in the spring. Um, it's, a, it's an email uh, away or a phone call to a teacher. If they're busy teaching, 
well, um, they do get right back to the students. So it's something that we're, you know, we're watching, we're watching closely. We spent two hours after school today talking about um, what that looks like on a Monday and how teachers can make sure that we're watching the progress of every student. Mrs. Parkhurst, um, because we're starting a new school year and you know our focus is on certainly social emotional health and well-being and um you know as we discussed previously you know unlike the spring we're starting a school year with teachers that don't know their students they haven't met them yet so in these asynchronous situations where there isn't how do how is that relationship being developed by our staff by the elective area teachers? Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking every teacher has their own relationship with a student. And I'm just wondering, you know, how we're kind of considering that in the model. Um, is that random by teacher? Are there suggestions to staff? Um, you know, is it a consistent experience from student to student? Well, for the virtual student and the elective area teacher, I mean, they're certainly conscientious of, um, you know, not having a scheduled synchronous class with them. Um, I really need to take that conversation back to the team. And, and I, you know, I agree it's important for us to be um, cognizant of that need. Um, I, I can't really speak on behalf of the specific things that elective area teachers are doing at this point, but they, I'm, I'm, I'm sure that they are spending countless uh, hours reaching, reaching their kids. I just can't speak to specific examples, uh, Mr. Cordo. I'm just asking just to reassure our community and our families that, you know, we're doing the best we can under the circumstances and we're not, you know, really certainly there's a lot to take on and, you know, easily some things can be missed, but I know I hear that, you know, from some families, they wonder about that, you know, a student working with a teacher that they really don't know and, you know, what, and if it's asynchronous, then that makes it a bit all together. It makes it a little bit more challenging, it seems. Yeah, yeah, certainly. I mean, I, I know that our music teachers have been reaching out to, uh, to, uh, to our, our performing group students to schedule lessons. Um, so, I mean, I can speak on behalf of our music department and, and what that looks like. Um, I, I don't know of specific examples for technology, art. Um, I, I know that they're talking with kids. I, I, I just don't know of a specific system that they may have in place. Well, we'll come back to that. That's a great question, uh, yeah. Mr. Cordon. What we'll do is we'll come back. Obviously, this is a, it's growing by the day, but this is an area where we're gonna seek to, to, obviously it's an area where engagement is key, where our kids know who we are and, and whatnot. So, We'll make sure we take that into consideration. So thank you, Ms. Parkers, for putting you on the spot a little bit this evening. Can I make a couple questions just to Ms. Parkers as well? Sure. sure. Okay. Um, you said that in the morning and in the afternoon that the teachers are available to meet with their students on the Mondays. But if a student reaches out, those teachers could set up individual help sessions as well with their kids. Is that correct? Sure. Yes. Yeah. So that can I was Sorry, uh, Mrs. Abelgore, I was speaking um, specifically to that time on Mondays, um, but most teachers have an afternoon block where they have meets time that they are available for students um, after the students dismiss at 1230. So yes. Okay, I just wanted to make sure that um, students know to advocate for themselves for that. So that, I mean, because we know some of our, I know that I had a, a student who might not have um, back in the day, but you know, just so that they know to email or, or to go to the meets to make sure their teacher knows if they're struggling, if they're the, in the asynchronous days. Sure. Um, our site team actually talked about this last week when we met and we're, um, they recommended they, uh, to the leaders of the school that we put together um, a specific example for families um, to show what a Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday and a virtual student schedule looks like. The parents on the site team commented that um, when we put that out for the first three virtual days that it was very helpful for parents to know exactly what was um, expected of the students. Um, today, we tapped, uh, tapped into um, a couple of students with the help of Mr. Wilson, and we're actually putting a video together of some students 
describing what they're like you could reading their schedule and and really describing to us to the public and community um, what their schedule looks like so we'll as soon as we have those pieces ready um, we will we will get them out um, we fully recognize that it, it, it can easily be confusing and then one other question I have, and this this kind of goes along uh, to the attendance for our, our kids on those asynchronous days. Um, do, do you think that uh, we are marking everybody present that's taking place? And what happens for those students who uh, they may be waiting to meet with one of those guided teachers and for whatever reason, there's not a connection there um, or? We are in the thick of, uh, a conversation about how we take attendance. Um, that was the focus of our meeting after school today. We are recognizing that we're struggling there. So we are, we're looking at um, making some adjustments with how daily attendance is taken. And along those lines, you know, as a parent, I'm wondering, I'm concerned for students that then might find themselves in a, with a failing, in a failing situation at the interim or the end of the quarter um if we don't you know what i mean if we really don't have a good handle on that um and and i certainly hope that we're you know communicating with parents of anybody that might be disengaged um just to ensure that they're aware and, and they can intervene from home and sure and and that's really why this guided um i'm going to call it guided study hall that's how we know it but that is really why the guided piece is is um, a significant piece of, of every student's program so that so that we can monitor and, and avoid students from falling too far behind. <clears throat> As a matter of fact, we had a freshman uh, reach out to her guided teacher quite early this morning, and she just said, "I'm really struggling." Um, so she did exactly what we're teaching the what the students to do. It, and um, maybe Sam, since he's with us tonight, is can tell us if he's. I don't know if he's hybrid, if he's um, learning from home, but maybe he could tell us you know, how his day is going from a student perspective. Um, I, I think personally that the students are getting a lot of help from um, the emotional support and stuff like that. And when I am in school, um, the classes are the same as last year. Like I still get the same amount of information that I need. And even when I'm online on Thursdays and Fridays, it's still like I get a lot of help. So. Thank you. Yeah, and I just want to add to that. So I've got students at the high school and at the elementary, and we had a technology problem this week, and my youngest couldn't get on, and his teacher reached out, and then they set up another Google Meet. They were really good about um, bending over backwards to set up a Google Meet to you know meet with my son, and then my oldest missed a Google Meet. He didn't have the right time down, and his guided study hall was amazing, and text text me and text him just to make sure see if there's any good times we could do to get um get with him and get him on a google meet and i've seen um open hours for um the elective classes for several teachers really going above and beyond plus you know engaging videos and things like that but i'm seeing office hours for all those special area classes too um as a parent so i know they're working hard and really trying to engage and get a hold of all those students on my end i'm seeing I should turn my mic back on. Any other questions um, for Ms. Parkhurst? She's welcome to stay. <laughs> yes, are we seeing everything on the slide that you're showing us? It looks like something might be chopped off, but maybe it's not very much. Uh, Dan, can you just share what that is? This We'll share this with the board. It's something that um, we put together over the last 24 hours or so, really trying to flush out a little bit further to, to really help. And I think it'll be great for the community as well really juxtaposing you know, what students and staff are doing. And this actually chart goes all the way down to, I believe, kindergarten, correct, Dan, if I remember incorrectly? Right, this, this is broken out by grade level band. So elementary, junior high, and high school. And, and so the, the idea here is to show what a teacher's day looks like on a Monday. And again, the focus there is on, in addition to that individual contact and support that Sam, um, spoke about um, 
it's also to make sure that we have ample time for PLC collaboration and for the professional development that our teachers need to do the best job they can in this very new environment. Um, so on the left there, we see the teacher's day. On the right, we see examples that were shared from the department chairs today of the types of uh, asynchronous learning opportunities that took place yesterday. I mean, can you just slide up? Is that on the same set of slides, Mr. Uh, Carroll, to see the elementary, please? Sure. Just to give you an idea. So in elementary, all students, and this applies uh, universally, whether a student is in our hybrid model or online only, all students start the day with a 9-10 class meet um, with their teacher. We'll start on the student side for, for K-6. Uh, during, that, um, during that class meet, uh, the main focus, in addition to some SEL morning meeting related uh, sharing, is for the teacher to uh, remind the students of what we're calling and really excited about uh, Mix It Up Mondays. Mix It Up Mondays are the concept of our special area team, our online special area team led by Will Meekum. And they have developed uh, a menu, really, of different student self-directed uh, opportunities in art, music, PE, and library. So the students have some choice in their day. They're able to choose among uh, asynchronous and sometimes live um, lessons and activities in those special areas. Meanwhile, on the teacher side, after teachers finish their Google Meet with their class, they are getting into the heavy lift of their uh, PLC work. Uh, we've set up the day on Mondays so that um, district level PLCs meet first, just after that Google Meet, so that they can be in sync with the instruction for the week. Later in the day, uh, PLCs at the building level break out and figure out together, collaborate around how those district level decisions are going to break down into their own building or online teams. There's also time built into the day, of course, for their professional development. We'll share this chart with you. And as we clean it up and tighten it up a little bit, we'll also uh, make this available as part of one of our resources out on our website as well. In the junior high, the student experience is very much like um, what we heard from at GRB, very similar types of asynchronous experiences. And also um, office hours are available for the students just as we heard described at GRB. Mr. Carroll, have we heard anything from parents concerning um, the 9-10 start time for all students for Mondays? I just know as me as a parent, getting both my kids, and luckily I only have two, on that 9-10 at the same time in different rooms and trying to support them both um, is difficult for me, and I'm a decent multitasker. I can't imagine having more than two children and running around and trying to get all of those. I'm not criticizing, I'm just saying, I know as a parent, sometimes it's really tricky. Um, and maybe it, is, it is tricky, I agree, as a parent of three elementary children. Yeah. And um, I wouldn't be surprised if my wife is watching the meeting and uh, <laughs> nodding her head at the challenge of having a first, third, and, and fifth grader yeah. trying to synchronize those. Quite honestly, we hear, um, we hear, both perspectives of that. On the one hand, we hear appreciation from uh, parents who, who value a consistent and reliable schedule, where on the other hand, we hear about the challenges of multiple children getting on at the same time. One thing that I think our teachers have done a really, really great job, and I'm glad to hear that you've had this experience, is reaching out with families. Um, our online only team, I uh, really want to give kudos to, they have committed to um, connecting individually with every family of every one of their students over the first two weeks to get some feedback from them about how their meet times and how their schedule's going. So this is something that 
we're very much aware of the pros and cons of the different types of scheduling. Unfortunately, we recognize there's not going to be a model that's going to be best for everyone. But I think that our teachers are really doing a fantastic job of listening to their students, parents, and adjusting and making those kind of accommodations. I'm happy to, to hear that you've experienced. Okay, thank you. Yeah. I just had one more question, Mr. Carroll, and, and it's not for tonight because I think we're only two Mondays in. Um, but if we could, you know, eventually get perhaps kind of an overview of Mondays, what is happening on Mondays, um, I would appreciate that because I know there has to be a lot of um, professional development that our teachers are experiencing with this shift in how they do their, you know, they perform their work and, and their practice. So. Um, I would really be interested in knowing, you know, what is being offered to them on Mondays and, and um, how that's looking. Sure. We'd be happy to. And we can give a more detailed uh, look also at how the PLC structure in those Mondays. Dan, can, or Mr. Carroll, can you put up um, our PowerPoint, go back to where we were so we can continue our update with respect to reopening, please? Sure. And thank you, Mrs. Parkhurst. Nice yes, thank you, Ms. Parkhurst. Thank you. So if we can go on to the next slide, please. <clears throat> Meal distribution. Um, so far, um, that was as of Friday, we had 38.71 and 36.30 lunches. We're still working on getting the word out there. It's the same thing that happened in the spring. Um, it's out there, we are available every day. There's um, food at, you know, available at our distribution sites, which are at each of our schools. Um, we're working with Ms. Um, Warwick, on other alternative ways that we may be able to provide that as well. I wanna make sure that all of our kids and families, you know, the, the desire to have their children have those meals are getting them. And so we are committed to doing that um, and we'll continue to find ways and explore to ensure that our families are there. We're also, there's a handful of families that are remote that um, are also possibly seeking delivery. Um, and we know who those families were in the spring as well because they may not have um, transportation to be able to do that. So, um, and so we'll be exploring that as well. So very proud of that. The kids are eating their breakfasts and lunches in the classroom. Uh, talk about um, strategies. Today, uh, I noticed every little can was outside the, the classrooms. I happened to go through uh, right after breakfast time in one of the schools and it was, it worked, was working very well. Um, so I'm very proud of our, of our staff if I figured out creative ways as all of our students are eating their breakfast and their lunches in the classroom. Uh, and coming up with solutions to be as efficient as possible. So it was pretty neat walking through the buildings today. So thank you to all the staff that's um, thinking creatively and our custodians who are uh, figuring out. We've seen a lot of creativity um, as we've moved forward. So it's, it's fantastic. Next slide, please. Regular health screenings. Um, we have all staff are completing a Google form screening prior to arrival every morning. Uh, the buildings or department, there's a designee in every department to ensure that those are going in each and every day. Um, with respect to students, uh, we do the daily temperature check for all of our in-person students. Uh, we've learned that thermometers uh, in very, very cold weather, we've learned something about those, so we're figuring out a strategy to address that uh, better now than when we get our first snowfall. Uh, so we're working through that, and knock on wood, we've figured out a few solutions with that, but we'll continue to monitor. Um, and think about strategies because we know that it's going to get a bit more uh, chilly out there. Mr. Lisi, do you want to speak to the, the school tool forms, please? Uh, sure, happy to do it. So we're using a school tool form. I'm just going to pause a second, let the echo go. So we're using a school tool form to, uh, for, the hip, for the health screenings. Uh, one of the things that we're going to be using uh, hopefully next week is our new Blackboard system to reach out to families that have not responded to the health screening. So we'll be uh, conducting that later next week. And what I want to add to that, interestingly, the state guidance talks about periodic for students on the form. So it's daily for staff, periodic. However, we wanted to have more frequent 
Um, and we are monitoring those very closely. There's been, um, and those yeses, when they pop up, we've contacted and some have been um, inaccuracies or, or there were others where they gave us the information and that's been extremely helpful. So we're working on that um, as well. So periodic, we really want to have more of a defined uh, piece. So that's why we're reaching out and doing that. Um, is, next slide, please. Student transportation. So our goal has been to consistently reduce time since the first day. And that's been happening. Our drop off, our final call in the afternoon when buses have completed the runs, we've, I think, reduced about an hour so far from about 4.30 to about 3.30. However, we're still working on that dismissal at by 2.10. The goal is to have our schools cleared by 2.10. And I was at one elementary school today, they were about 2.15. Um, and I want to check with the other principals as well. So this is an area where we're really honing in on how we can work on that. We're looking at the routes. Uh, we're looking at the TransFinder system, which is our routing system, uh, to best see how we can address those issues because the goal is efficiency, and we're doing that. We're also, uh, as I mentioned, I mentioned the systems approach, and our cleaning procedures seem to be working well. We've built in that time between runs uh, to be able to do that. We're monitoring those uh, closely as well and making sure that you know, all our procedures, and that there's a lot of buses out there anytime that we receive any word, um, obviously, we're reinforcing all the positives and we're addressing any issues that may come up as well. So um, with that, again, that monitoring is very close and or very important to us and it's essential for us to improving. And then also I would be remiss if I didn't uh, acknowledge that Golden Sun and our own transportation department have been doing a, a great job working on this as they think creatively uh, as, we, as we work through um, how do we maximize our transportation while maximizing not only the seats and the ability to transport, but our ability to ensure that our kids are safe and secure during those routes. Um, so I'm very pleased um, uh, with the work that they've done. So I'd be remiss if I didn't uh, acknowledge and thank them um, for all of their work, as well as our food services and all the work that they're doing as well. Um, next slide, please. Our COVID expenditures, we'll go over a little bit after uh, at, in, in the, later in, in today's presentation is actually a separate um, item as number three, but our total expenditures to date are 341,000. I did note that the placemats uh, costs weren't on there. Uh, I need to make sure that those go on there as well. Um, a lot of these are offset by CARES grants. We, we mentioned those at the last and they were in an update that we provided. Um, with respect to the different, the ESSER, as well as the ESSA, the different grants that are available. Uh, and so we're working on both of those. So we're, we're monitoring those very closely in your board backup and we'll, we can show it afterwards. It actually has a listing of all of the different things that we have purchased from thermometers to um, placemats, trying to find ways to keep the desks as um, safe as possible as kids are eating their lunches, things like that. Um, as well as um, uh, school supplies and such. So um, uh, we can go over those in a few minutes. The next slide. So our athletics. Um, and I'm going to have uh, Mr. Els and, and Mr. And, and Sam will, will talk a little bit. But the fall sports were postponed until fall two season. I know that's been a, a challenging thing for the community. And, and I know that, you know, I started tonight off by talking about our reopening plan. And and making sure that we are so in sync with the Department of Health guidance, the CDC guidance, the NYSED guidance, and all of those things. And when you're bringing in 2,100 kids, we got to get it right. And I've seen some districts that have had some challenges. We watch very closely and we try to learn from those. Um, but we want to make sure this is right because I hope to see down the road and, and hopefully not a year from now. Hopefully it's much, much sooner than that for all sorts of reasons. Hopefully there's vaccines and all sorts of things that will get us there. I want to see that 3,273 kids back in our, in our schools and that's why we have that commitment to our reopening plan and getting it right. The students are working with Mr. Ellis to explore options for providing team intramural and internal sports activities to continue student engagement, health, and wellness. And before I turn it over to Mr. Ellis and Sam, um, I'm just very proud of the conversations that, that I've had with kids um, on Thursday last week, Friday last week, and then I didn't get the privilege of being with them. Mr. Ells got the privilege of actually being with them yesterday. Uh, and uh, so Mr. Ells and Sam, thank you to our students who are representing their peers um, extremely well. So Mr. Ells and Sam, 
Great. <clears throat> Thank you. Thanks for bringing me on tonight. Um, let's have Sam go ahead and take the lead on what we're talking about uh, and go through the timeline that we have started with. Um, so we started with the meeting with the superintendent and Mr. or Mrs. Parker's on Thursday. Then we followed up with another meeting on Friday regarding the um, team intramural and sometimes practices and stuff like that. And we had a meeting Monday and we thought we kind of shortened it down, narrowed it down a little bit. And then we had another meeting today. And so the plan is to have intramural activities three times a week or two times a week and practice team practices two times a week as well. So kids can stay engaged in activities and still get that kind of team bond feeling and kind of just stay active. Great, thanks Sam for uh, providing that feedback. So uh, in addition to that, I've, I met with the coaches right prior to this meeting to see what kind of engagement that they could provide. Um, the coaches, as, as well as the kids, they're, they're excited to get going. Um, I mean, the kids have been cooped up for six months and they, they just want to play. Um, the intramural concept is, you know, tr trying to come up with different kind of team sports and trying to come up with some kind of different activities for them. Um, that is one avenue we're exploring. Uh, and the other avenue is, I mean, like I said, the kids just want to play. They, they want to be with their teammates and they want to be practicing the sports that they love. Um, so our coaches are looking at, you know, providing those opportunities through different uh, practices throughout the week. Uh, and like I said, I met with the coaches right before this meeting. They came up with some great ideas. Um, they're not as excited as the kids because the kids are ecstatic to try to get out there and do something. But the coaches are very excited to get going as well. Any questions? Well, the intramurals expanded. They'll expand beyond um, students that are on teams, wasn't that? That was one of the things the kids talked about. Yes. Yeah, we could we could actually, you know, the intramural concept, uh, and the, the kids were kind of lukewarm on that, and the coaches were as well, just because we haven't really run an intramural program here before. Um, but as we were discussing it yesterday, you know, some of the kids were excited uh, with the possibility of, you know, playing a sport that they're that they don't excel in. Um, for example, a football player possibly playing a soccer or, you know, um, you, you know, one of the other ideas was playing some yard games, you know, do it like a, a, you know, one week unit of, you know, yard games where they're doing like can jam or, or cornhole or some activities like that, that they would enjoy playing. So we looked at some different type of intramural activities like that. Um, we just haven't worked out all the details as of now. Um, I will be meeting again with the, the student athletes uh, tomorrow at 1230. Um, Mr. Al, uh, in the conversations that you've had with students, some of the concerns that I have heard from their perspective is that if too many sports are competing for their participation in the spring, those that participate in a particular sport in the fall then kind of are forced to choose in the spring. There's also the competition for space. We know that, you know, our, our weather doesn't always allow for outside use of fields and the facilities and that kind of drives us inside. So, you know, what are any of those, you know, are, 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 were those part of any of your conversations with this group? And then if you can share what, if you have thought that through, what will that look like for the spring? And, um, Sure. So, uh, there's a lot of questions in there. So let me see if I can grab all of those. So um, the first one is, you know, uh, kids competing, um, you know, with overlapping seasons. Um, our league has discussed, our Salt City Athletic Conference has uh, discussed different avenues of being able to move the seasons and shift the seasons. Um, and if you haven't heard, the spring season has actually been shifted by Section 3. So spring sports aren't even going to begin until the third week of April. So that's already been a move by Section 3. Um, whereas, you know, football, volleyball, and the rest of the fall sports, that's going to begin on March 1st. So 
that that season is going to go from March 1st till the end of April. And then the other season is going to begin. Like I said, Section 3 has set a, a date of the third week of April. Um, our league has been discussing what we could do to possibly even back it up more. Um, so there isn't conflicting um, uh, conflicting sports or choices out there. So the kids would still be able to play their fall sport, which is now in the spring, and their spring sport. So that, that was part of it. Um, you, you know, another part that we talked about, like, was the, our turf, right? Our turf is March 1st. There's usually a foot of snow on our turf. Um, we have looked at the possibility of, in this extreme circumstance of, uh, you know, being able to plow our turf or getting the snow removed off of there. Um, there are companies out there that have a safe way of doing it. And as I discussed with our student athletes and our coaches, um, while that is not the best for our turf, um, our turf company that installed our turf did say uh, there are uh, avenues out there where we could do that. Um, and we are getting towards the end of our the life expectancy of our turf anyways. And for the students that then would be moved to the spring, their competition you're describing is only being kind of an intramural um, format that would just have them competing against our own students. Now you're ta you're talking about in the springtime, right? Yeah. Are, if we're postponing them until the spring, who then are our fall athletes competing with when our their competition, all the rest of the districts are competing at this point in the school year? Sure. They so so um, the 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 statement of all. So not all schools did uh, go with fall sports. So there are 32 schools in Section Three. Um, there's about seven to eight schools that we could, you know, compete with. I mean, obviously we can't compete with some of the C's and D schools, but there are, there are A, B's and even double A schools that have reached out to us um, to be able to put a schedule together. So there are opportunities of some school districts out there that we could compete against in the springtime with our fall sports. And is it true that the rest of our county is not doing that? um the re the rest of oswego county has uh, is all playing fall sports at this time thank you actually i just to, for clarification sandy creek is not as well jefferson oh, okay. county schools did not they voted as a collective the 12 schools um and that includes those are indian rivers carthage camden so on and so forth watertown and sandy creek is in our county so Sandy Creek is not competing this fall. But they usually compete in with Jefferson County, correct? Correct, correct. Uh, so Sandy Creek is part of the Frontier yeah. League, which is going to take all your northern schools. Yeah. All right. So Sam, one of the things I wrote down, I wrote down I wanted to say, one of the things that the students said on, I think it was Thursday and Friday, that you're the you're our leaders and one of the things that we're learning through covid and everything else and i'm sorry it took that long to learn that lesson um but the students um you you said we need to be the leaders in our school you need we need to be a part of the solutions and and i will tell you, you almost brought me to a little emotional there that day because i think you guys remember i said that i was so proud of when you guys said that um and i think it's essential so if anything we're learning in here is, here's our next great opportunity to ensure that our kids have the voice because um, that's something, I look for the silver lining in everything. And this is one of those silver linings that I, one of the kids said Thursday, what, let's see if it happens. Where were we on Friday? We were having a meeting. We're, and then look where we are uh, less than a week later. So Sam, you gotta keep us, you gotta keep us uh, right pushed right to it, all right? Make sure that we're, we continue to deliver. Um, I'm very proud of the work that Mr. Ells and, and the team has done. I believe did we ended up with almost every team represented too. Wasn't that what I, our goal was that, right? That happened, right? Yes. Uh, yes. That was something that came out when we met with the board members and the students the other day on Friday that came up and actually one of the board members said, now every school, every, every team's going to have a rep, right? Uh, and uh, that happened. So again, Sam, spread the word. And, you know, the one way we hold accountable, we have to be accountable to one another. And that's what you got to do. If you're not seeing that, you got you guys got to speak up. And that crew, 
I don't think there's gonna be any issue with that. And then I think others will speak up as well. So again, I, I, wonder, I wrote that down because it, it hit, hit me right where it needed to be. And this is gonna make us stronger uh, as we move forward. So thank you to you and all of your, your uh, colleagues who are representing your peers extremely well. I'm very proud of you and you should be proud of one another. So thank you and Chris, you've done a nice job uh, with them and the coaches as well. I appreciate their flexibility. Um, the, the coaches, you know, I, I do just want to finish up with our coaches, you know, uh, before we move on to the next one. I mean, you know, our student athletes, they do a great job. They always impress me. They're always, uh, you know, uh, they, they always have those leadership qualities and skills. And, you know, that goes back to what our coaches do. Um, our coaches build those skills. Um, they work with our student athletes and they make sure that, you know, they're, you know, they're respectful in their decisions or in their, in their voices. And, um, you know, I was, you know, really impressed with our student athletes, but also, you know, all the work that our coaches do and continue to do, whether it is during season or off season. So I just wanted to make sure that, you know, I put a plug out there for them. Yep. And you could have read my mind. That's why I was going to say flexibility and exactly what you said. Their commitment is unbelievable. Uh, I've watched them. I've had the opportunity to see all of our coaches since I've been here and they're amazing, you know, every one of them. So thank you to, to all of them for everything that they do. So, and with that, thank you uh, to both of you for presenting. Uh, next slide, please. Ms. Mr. Ellis, yep. can I ask you a question? Please. Yep, go ahead, Ms. Abelgore. When, when you get a little closer, because I know you and the students are working super hard putting together uh, what your fall practice and intramurals will look like, um, but will you be able to put something together for us so we know obviously that the safety aspect is being taken care of and that the, the kids are, are doing exactly what they ch are choosing to do for this? And possibly um, when you put together those intramurals, would it be possible maybe to live stream some of those so that their families can be kind of watching what their intramurals look like? Yeah, that's, that's, that's a possibility. That's, yep, I'd have to work with Tim on that, but I think we could try to pull something off of that. I have one quick question. I don't mean to be a broken record, but I wondered if um, our modified students would, uh, I, I think you said you'd be working on that after this got put together, Mr. L. Something Correct, like yes, yes. So, I mean, our modified kids are just like our, our modified meaning our junior high students are just like our you know, you know, our high school, our varsity and JV sports, and you know, they want to play, they probably want to play more. So we will we will be be uh, providing some kind of opportunity for them as well. And I do have, just have one more question, and I know you know this all seemed to happen fast, and um, we're working through it. But what have we learned from it that we're going to put in place as we as the winter sports approach? Chris, you want to answer? Or do you want me to? I, I actually I wrote I had that down too, Dave. Um, I had written down winter. One of the things we talked about in our meetings on Thursday or Friday, I can't remember which day, one or the other, we talked about that um, the kids actually pushed hard and, and they were thinking exactly the way we were, which is we want to make sure that we have Fulton expectations set very clear uh, for the winter season and that, that we're taking a lead um, for Fulton and, and working with our competitors, uh, hopefully as we go into that winter season. Anything you'd add to that? It's kind of what we talked about, Chris, but... Right, right. I mean, that, that pretty much sums it up. Okay. All right, more to follow. We'll keep you appraised of what's going on. And and uh, I thought, Brenda, your idea of at least getting some ideas there would be great to actually show our kids out on, on and doing what they're doing. Challenges, just to kind of summarize, enrollment is fluctuating. Uh, the increased requests for online right now, I think things will settle, but we're also seeing more and more cases kind of popping up in school districts um, across the state. You'll see it here and there's, and I think we're gonna see those kinds of things, but hopefully if we can keep those small and we can keep our focus. So obviously, but I think that gets in people's minds and we're heading into different types of uh, seasons as far as flu and cold and so on and so, uh, so, on and so forth. Continue to support for families navigating the online learning, the supply chain challenges. Um, we've been fortunate in a lot of different ways. Uh, the team has been working hard um, Mr. Ells uh, has done an amazing job finding things that uh, masks and things like that, that he's gotten very creative and, and that's helped. Um, so we were in a better place than, uh, than when I thought we were going to be. So that was fantastic. The bins that we're using, all of those kinds of things. So thank you to them or him and all the different teams that are working in their areas. 
and then the re return to work uh, to school and the work protocols are also um, with the state guidance it's very um, you get some inconsistencies between departments of health so you get inconsistency with the state and as we goes and it's just everybody's trying to work through this so again um, we spend a great deal of time um, interacting with the Department of Health on a weekly basis, uh, as well as our medical director and, and his team out of us we go. Uh, and with that, I believe that's the, the last slide. Are there any questions? You can take that down, I think, and we're Mr. good. Mr. Yep. Mr. Mulvin, I just have two questions. Um, our virtual students, I know that the district was supplying them with school supplies. Did they get their school supplies yet? Not as of yet, what we're doing, we had a, the, the W.B. Mason had a delay and we had enough to get open. I believe we had a little bit out there, but I think what we're doing is we've ordered bags. They're gonna be bagged up. We expect the delivery should be in. They said they were shipping Monday and Tuesday this week on Friday last week. So I will confirm that that's coming in and we've already been talking to Golden Sun uh, and our team about how we could get that those pieces out to our families um, as quickly as possible. Okay, and then my other question is, um, I looking at the enrollment numbers, and I know nobody is a crystal ball, but I mean we're really tight with that thirty percent. Um, what's going to happen if we get a big influx of students wanting to return to school or students want to go virtual? I mean, I know we really don't have room for virtual at this point, and physical space is another question. What are what are some of the discussions that are being had if that happens. Yeah, so what we had talked about um, early on was that we would reset, we would um, reach out and, and try to fi find out from families if they want to continue on virtual, getting feedback from families about how their experience has been. Um, I don't I want to get my math wrong, but I want to say around that week of Columbus Day, we would, we would do that and we would spend the majority of the month of October exploring. Obviously, one of the things that we said this summer was that we'd have to take a strong look at our virtual model um, or our in-person model if we had a strong influx of, of students that wanted to re-engage. So I think what we have to do is we have to collect that information and then what we have to do is we'll make our adjustment based on that because um, our commitment was for 10 weeks. Okay, and so, so obviously you want to start that around the sixth week, start going. Are we gonna, how are we gonna do that? Are we gonna push out a survey to all parents? Are we going to reach out to just the students who are virtual? What does that look like for us for communication? Yep, so we're working on that right now about what that would look like. We actually had that, I lose track of the days now, it was either Friday or yesterday. We had that conversation, we started talking about how would we go about that um, gathering of information and survey process. Obviously, um, we want to get a barometer on how things are going. Right now, it's too early to send it out because we don't have enough experience, but we don't, we don't want to wait too long. So <clears throat> we're having that conversation as a team. And you know, I think obviously I want to get some feedback from all families. And then obviously we need some feedback um, specifically with our remote as well as our in-person. I mean, they have some different experiences going on. Um, but we also recognize that that could change our model significantly if things swung one way or the other. Um, obviously, the optimist in me, you know, would love to see um, things get, you know, um, better and better so we could have more kids and coming, but they're not going to change those ratios and things like that. So obviously, space is the space. Um, so our goal would be to continue to maximize every opportunity we could have. That would be the commitment we would have. So, I, you know, the data will be very important for us. And are we sure. bringing the golden sun for in those conversations as well, because if we get an influx one way or another, they right. may have to just root through things like that. Oh yeah, it would be the whole, it, okay. every time we adjust that plan, you have to look at every single ask. What we have, if we've learned is if you adjust one thing in the plan, it adjusts three other things at the same time. <laughs> so, I just wanna make sure. Yep. It, it just as a follow up to Mrs. Cooper's question, because I think it's important the communication piece that she's raising and with that, I'm trying to imagine the families that need advance notice if there's going to be a change in the model. So how much advance time will they have if we're revisiting the model and have to make a change to it as it might impact them? Yeah, I, I don't have a calendar. I, I don't want to pull up my calendar on my screen. Doing my math, the end of the marking period is either the first end of the first week in November. I don't have it right in front of me. What we would do is work backwards. And what I would say our goal, and our goal, I think at this point, without mapping it out, what I can say to you, uh, Mr. Cordon is a great question. We should map that out 
and we can share that map when we put the survey out. That might be the best way to do that. If you think about backwards design, you actually begin with the end in mind. So what we'd want to do, and I think you're correct, I think families would need at least a couple of weeks to be able to get their feet under them if we had to make a significant adjustment. That's why that time frame is important. That's why I was, I was thinking that, that right around Columbus Day, that four-day week would be the perfect week to have the data come in. And then that following week, we do intense work, and then we do the notifications. Um, we monitor the data as it's coming in, so we have a pretty good idea of the trends. So we don't have to wait till, you know, the closing of it. It'll give us an idea of the trends. Um, you know, I, it, it, you know, one might, it may stay the same it is now. Everybody may feel very comfortable with where they're at. I think we'll see some adjustment um, as well. So again, um, we've gone up about four percent, four to five percent since it started. Depending on the grade level, we we're at between twenty-five and twenty-eight, and we're at thirty-one, thirty-two. So, so we're thinking somewhere after you said Columbus Day weekend. Yeah, I would say the week of the survey. I let my team and I map that out, but I was thinking either the week before or the week after. We want to make sure there's enough weeks for families to get a real good feel about what this feels like, you know, an experience so they can make an informed decision. You know, an informed decision and, and give us informed feedback. That's probably a better, a better term, informed feedback. Let me just get that written down. Thank you. All right. So the next piece on our agenda, and again, you know, we can always ask, answer, ask more questions. The second piece was the financial update. Um, in the um, board docs, and you, what I'll do is I'll put it up. Ms. Nichols, are you, where are you there on the screen? Are you there? Um, can you hear me? I can hear you now. All right, I was looking right. here. I don't know if my camera's working or not. No, it is not. You. We can only hear you, we cannot see you. If you could start I, off by sharing um, some information with respect to our our revenues, and we're as far as our, our let me say it differently, our state aid that's been coming in. If you could speak to our state aid, and I can see if I can find that piece to put up on the screen. Ryan, certainly. Uh, yes. Excuse me. We you had said we we're yeah. going to come back to our, our the COVID supplies. Oh, cheapers. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, I have a question about it. Yeah, um, uh, Dan, can you put up that on the screen or I can do it? Do you have that? Which if you go to board docs, it's in the section on the right hand. It's in the um, section for the board presentations. I have a question about the sleeves. Have we ever received them? Well, Mr. Lisi, would you talk about sleeves? I know we have bags. We have sleeves now? Yeah, we have <clears throat> bags, drawstring bags we just handed out. The sleeves have still not arrived, unfortunately. Uh, virtually everything in relation to technology has been back ordered for months. Because so we're, we're still allowing them to use their backpacks, are we going to need those? We probably still will to protect the, the Chromebooks because they're still quite an investment. We want to be able to uh, put them in something that's waterproof and padded. Okay. Right. Dan, were you able to find that or, or not? I'm heading to it. I didn't have it open. So I don't have that one. All right. You know what? I'm going to show, even though I don't like not being able to see everybody, I will quickly put it up. One second, everybody. Is it the spreadsheet of the of all the expenses? That you're yeah, I'm on? actually already there. I'm almost there. Give me two seconds and we'll be right there. And here it is. Can everybody see that? Yes. I can make it a bit larger. So, uh, Ms. Lyons, this was the spreadsheet you were speaking to? It was. So what you'll see on the sheet, um, and what we've done is you'll see a range of things um, in here, the dates that we were ordering and such. Um, so you can see the range of things from Chromebooks, sleeves to the headphones, um, two gallon poly bags, why? Those are for, um, we can actually use those for um, school supplies, things like that for older children. We have the bins in all the classrooms. If you've not seen the plastic bins, um, those are we've had to order trash cans down here. Uh, you wouldn't think like why? Well, when you're when you're having students eat breakfast and lunch in the classroom, you need more receptacles available um, in a far reaching parts of the building. So we've had to do that. Obviously, we've ordered a lot of hand sanitizer, uh, exam gloves, um, you name it. Uh, it's here. 
So uh, disposable masks up here, 100,000 disposable masks. Uh, Chris, I uh, can't tell if you're still here or not because I can't see anybody, but uh, it's amazing what you accomplished trying to get your hands on these things. Um, well, that was, that's 100,000 adult masks and we have another 100,000 children's masks. Uh, the two gallon bags were, were used for uh, putting our PPE products in. Each classroom has a, a bag of PPE of um, hand sanitizer, uh, masks, and uh, tissues. So every classroom has that, every office. Yep. Yeah, Chris, anything else you want to point out on here? Chris was kind of, he was the, the lead, obviously, on all of our, our key PPE items, our thermometers. Um, I don't know how many we have now. Um, <laughs> We ha we should we should have 184 thermometers. Yeah. <laughs> so it, it just gives you an idea. And at the bottom of the page, on the last page here, you'll see where our total is right here, right now. I did note one area, and I can ask Miss Warwick right here uh, was the was the uh, the placemats. And what those are our placemats. So um, it was an idea that came to us, um, and it was a good one. It was an idea that they said, well. If kids are plant, have their food and they want to take it out of the bag and things like that, obviously they could rip the bag, but they also had the idea of the, of the paper placemats. Um, and so it was something that we pursued. So we're piloting that as well. So just a lot of creativity on how to um, keep our students and staff as safe as possible. So, and then how many miles of tape did you order, uh, Mr. Uh, Ells? Uh, I, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> Well, we have 601, you know, rolls of, of floor tape. We had cases of it. Um, I'd be remiss. The taping team was amazing as well. So uh, they, everybody's just done a, a good job. So you can get an idea of all the things. Our laptops are in here. Um, our Chromebooks, um, you name it, there, everything is in here. So there's, we'll continue to build this list as we go along. Anything that's related to this, because we want to be able to tie it back to any of the CARES grants um, that are coming out from the state to make sure that we can demonstrate where those expenses may be able to be addressed. Mr. Palmino, with those laptops, is that aidable? Is there anything that we're going to be able to get money back on those? Yeah, Mr. Lacey? Yeah, we, we have a care, part of the CARES grant is for technology specifically. So hotspots, laptops, that sort of thing, we will, uh, we will be able to get both grant money and in some cases uh, it'll be COSERD through BOCES. Okay, and then my I have two more questions. And so to piggyback on Mrs. Lyon's um, question earlier about the sleeves, I, I'm on the fence. I can understand why they would be very helpful and useful with the cushion and the waterproofing, but it's also $25,000. It's really a lot of money that makes me nervous in such a tight budget. Um, I'd be remiss if I didn't point that out. And then my other question is the bins. According to my count, and my math could be wrong, um, we have over 5,000 bins, but we have 3,000 students. Why do we need so many bins? So I can I can speak to that a little bit. First of all, the sleeves, where we landed with that is if they're going to be delayed much longer, we probably will think of other options or, or just pass on them because it's going to get to the point where it won't make sense. Um, and from what we understand, if the delay continues to where I think it will, that's probably what will happen. So that's uh, important to point out. The bins, I, I know, Mr. Ells, are you still here? If not, I'm still I, here. Yeah, there. I'm still oh, here. Okay. Oh, he's ready and willing. Right. Right. <laughs> I'm not going anywhere. I'll be, right. I'll be here to answer all your questions tonight. So. Right. <laughs> Part of the reason. The bin, the bins, I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not sure what that, where that number came from. Um, I, I do know that we have enough bins for the students that we have here. Uh, coming in person. So there is an extra bins. Um, finding those bins in the first place was a was a huge task. So I don't believe that I, I know we didn't order 5,000 bins, but I do know that we had to order some and then cancel some orders due to okay. we would order some and then found out that the delivery date was November or December. So obviously okay. canceled those. Yeah, I saw, I saw a thousand yeah, and then 1,200 at the bottom and then upper at the top there was like it appeared to be like a six pack of the 27 quart for 5,000. Right. So I, I will have, uh, I will have, uh, uh, Megan will go ahead and update that form to make sure we have accurate numbers there. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. 
So yeah, there's, there's a lot of materials on there. Um, I think we've tried to stay focused. And also that wouldn't be on there was we've increased our cleaning supplies. Our company increased that to one and a half uh, automatically back in June, they actually started that. So that's a cost that's a part of our facilities. Um, you know, so I, it's something I can get a cost on that as well. Um, because we did increase the number of obviously the cleaning supplies that you need to be able to do um, the type of cleaning that we're doing as well. I think we've gotten very creative with respect to the use of staffing uh, as well. Our aides have rose to the occasion. They're doing a lot of different roles and responsibilities um, as you go through the buildings and that is helping us um, to maintain our high level of, of uh, our focus on cleanliness as well. So um, as I walked through the buildings there was aides um, you know, checking kids in and out of uh, the bathrooms. They were monitoring, they were making sure that things were being out in the hallway, being taken care of, doing a really nice job supporting classrooms um, uh, as well. So um, a lot of good things going on in the district. Uh, Brian, Brian, does the does yep. Golden Sun have access to the same CARES Act funds that we do? Because I'm imagining their cleaning costs have increased as well. And I know we don't probably provide that to them, but do we know if they're, if, I mean, contractually, we have, we have a contract with them, but are they being, you know, are their expenses being offset by those federal funds as well? Yeah, we've been actually purchasing with them. So helping with the costs in bulk. So that's helping. So we're working closely with Patrick on that as well. I believe there are some funds available. I don't want to say yes. I would want to talk to Patrick about that as well. I'm just wondering, how tight, you know, that how much tighter that makes their budget as well. Yep, I will find out on that specific. I should know that answer. But I don't want to misspeak. I think I know it, but I don't want to think I know it. I want to know it. <laughs> so any any portion of the COVID money that's not covered by the CARES Act, where is that coming from? Since we didn't plan that in the budget. Yeah, anything that wouldn't be covered there would be um, obviously would have to come out of the general fund. And and when you hear, you know, I've heard districts say they've spent in the millions and I'm like, wow. Um, I think what we're trying to do is um, we've been following that guidance very closely, Nick. I think the other thing, if Kathy, I keep forgetting she's not, she's here, uh, but I'm not seeing her. So it's just out of, I'm not seeing her. Kathy, do you want to comment on that? Obviously, we, we had a bit of, of monies coming into our general fund, but Kathy, can you speak to our current status? Um, certainly. Um, I know that the... Uh, we really haven't gone over what the end of last year results are. I do know that um, the audit committee has an appointment to meet with the uh, one of the partners from Ray Wagger's group um, to go over uh, the draft um, audit report. But I can at least share that um, you know it, it, there, there's still a few moving targets um, as far as what our expenses are going to look at like. Uh, one of them uh, on the revenue side is the fact that we have the 20% uh, withholding that was done in August um, and September. Basically, they withheld 20% from our receivable from last year. So uh, I believe there was a sheet that I included with board backup this time. Yeah, Kathy, and, I'm going to put it up on the screen now. Okay. It's on the screen. All right, so on this, you can see is uh, as at the end of June last year, uh, we had aid that was supposed to come to us um, from the 1920 school year that is always paid out in uh, August and in September. And you can see we expected $3.7 million to come in, um, but the uh, um, uh, governor um, had, $746,000 of that withheld. So there was a, I labeled it a 20% cut. Um, it's a withholding at this point in time. Um, you know, I think everyone at this point in time has the same information. Uh, we, we know that uh, in September that they will pay the rest of the payments in full, which would be good news for us. We know that they've made our uh, TRS um, system payment. Uh, that's something that's done every year, uh, about 850000 for us. And we should be getting about another $5.5 million 
um, as an aid payment. Wow. So um, that is not supposed to be reduced. Uh, we've also, um, you know, basically the guidance that we've seen so far has said that, you know, the Department of Budget has to look to see if we're going to receive any sort of uh, federal um, federal help um, to, you know, to prevent these cuts from, or this withholding from becoming permanent. Um, also, the Department of Budget did indicate that they would look at the aid that, um, uh, that, uh, that would recognize that districts have different needs and a high need school district like a small city um, it could not handle a 20% cut in aid. And um, I know that small cities sent a letter out and that they are looking to make it a little more equitable if there are future cuts. So at this point in time, we know we'll receive money at the end of this month. We don't know what the cuts are really going to be. So it's not really um, positive news. The best, best situation would be if, um, if these were just temporary cuts and that um, we actually get that uh, 700,000 um, back from, uh, you know, back from what was withheld. Ms. Nichols? Yeah, go ahead. I, I had a, I wanted to point out something else. Please go okay. ahead. Um, just last year, even the uh, we did end up um, uh, being able to, we will be able to add to our fund balance. Um, currently, uh, before closing the books on June 30th, our fund balance was just over $11 million. That's our reserves and our um, un, um, you know, our, our actual unassigned fund balance. Uh, this year we should be adding, um, I'm just going to say in the neighborhood of 1.6 to 1.7 million to it. The board had um, acted, you know, uh, based on our results, had acted on in June on designating a million of that to go to three different reserves. Um, but you know, taking that into consideration um, and also if taking into consideration the 20% cut, we should still be at um, approximately $12 million in fund balance. So when we look at where we might have to go if, um, if there are more expenses related to COVID, uh, you know, we do have fun balance still to rely on, um, at least for a little while. You know, do I think we could handle a 20% overall cut, which, you know, we've talked about could be $10 million, you know, we'd make it a year. And so, um, but I also have hope and belief that the state wouldn't let that uh, happen to school districts uh, uh, like us. Um, Basically, we, we have a strong fund balance. Our budget for 2021, um, as you remember, only increased by about 423,000 over the current year, but it's still a good budget. It's a, it's, um, it's a tight budget, but it's, it's still, um, you know, we're still in good shape um, to keep spending within that. Um, I, I think it's just something we're going to have to monitor much more closely than we ever had before, especially as as there are COVID expenses and um, and as we have to change our um, our you know instructional model. Um, you know, we, I'm not even sure we know what uh, costs might be um, coming our way. So. Uh, yeah, I think. Uh, 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 a piece of good news, I think, was just recently, and, and one I shared the small cities letter, um, mm -hmm. would have been in your daily update yesterday. Um, and so thank you to small cities for writing that letter. Um, and second, um, the governor in the month of, was it September? We did not get garnished 20%. Isn't that what I read, Ms. Nichols, this month? There was some yes. not taking it this month, right? Yes, because if they had taken that, that would have been over a million dollars they would have been withholding. And I believe it was $3.06 billion across the state, if I read an article, I believe, if that 20% had happened. I believe that's what the number was. It was a high number. 
Yeah. Yeah. Brian, how are we um how are we covering the 20% cut with what we budgeted in terms, you know what I mean? If if that is realized, then how are we making up that shortfall? Yep. Kathy, do you want to talk or the um, 20%, if the 746,000 were to become permanent, um, I mean, there's two ways to look at it. I mean, part of it's the, from a cash flow standpoint right now, we, we at least have started tax collection. So from a cash flow standpoint, I'm not worried about it um, for the next couple months. If that, um, and, then, and then it's just, again, it, depending on what happens, if they continue to take, if they take any more from us, we will have to look to our fund balance to, um, you know, it, we would have to appropriate fund balance. You know, it, last year and this year, when we were doing the budget process, we did not appropriate any fund balance to help balance the budget. Um, we were able to do it just with, res, uh, with revenues that we anticipated. Um, so if, if we start exceeding uh, our spending plan, we'll have to look to our fund balance as a, you know, taking, basically taking money out of savings. Yeah, that'll be, that'll be obviously one, the stopgap. The other piece will be, and I think it's a great question, um, David, what I would say is we'd be coming back to you. One of the things, if you remember this spring, we had a prioritized list of, you know, things that we'd have to look at um, within the school system. Obviously, the, the centerpiece of, of everything we do is our reopening plan right now to make sure that everything with that reopening plan makes sure that it keeps our kids um, in those classrooms and everything instructional. Our strategic coherence plan helps with that, helps maintain that focus as well as what our priorities are. Um, I think the November date is going to be extremely important. Um, that seems, I, 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 it's unfortunate, I think it's probably related to the elections would be my guess. Um, and one of the pieces that, that is a bit frustrating is that you hear some glimmers of hope occasionally for federal stimulus, and then you hear things are kind of uh, at a standstill. And they've been talking about this one since July, so it's, it's going into the latter part of September, and we still don't have a stimulus bill. So obviously that's a piece. My team will go back to those lists, reprioritize those lists so that we are prepared um, if we had to go down um, the path. I think there's two ways. I think there's a combination of of keeping an eye on our fund balance and and if we had to use some, I will thank the board for the last two years. We've you've pushed and you've asked great questions and we've balanced our budget using revenues the last two years. Uh, we have not had to go in and you know fortunately what that's resulted in is to push us to our to prepare us to the best. It really is to the best of ability to walk into. To, to deal with and address this type of situation. But I would say the plan would be in the next few weeks and maybe in, in, the, in that first October meeting or that second October meeting at the latest, have a very clear idea of, hopefully have a better idea of what the governor is thinking, um, but also have a plan that we could enact um, to address things to the best of our ability. And obviously the path of COVID-19 is gonna be extremely important because I'm going to be, once again, I'm being an optimist positive that we will be staying the course, the rudder will be deep and everything's going to be great. And our, pro and our challenge will be, how do we make, make sure we maintain the course um, that we're try trying to maintain with respect to our reopening plan and all of the different assurances that we're responsible for uh, to ensure that our staff and kids and families are safe. So I think that's a, hopefully that's our challenge. Hopefully it's not, you know, there are, there's a breakout or something else like that, which is forcing us to do something differently. And I think all of those different pieces will, guide, will have to be a part of the decision-making process. Uh, a couple of things. If memory I don't know if it's not correct here. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, if memory serves, Brian, you were going to come back to the board and uh, with a plan for how you're going to do just that, uh, work on um, how we would handle the shortfall if we're not made whole. And the other thing is, is if we're not made whole, it's going to be a pretty big hole that we're gonna have to uh, work around and, and uh, find fixes. 
I, I would point to my colleagues, to some of the other small cities that attempted to do that, make those adjustments, and it it, it became uh, evident rather quickly that um, because we're a people business, uh, it's it's uh, pretty devastating to program. So I, I it's something we do. I agree. Keep our eye on every day. I'd like to be optimistic, but. We, we really have to plan in ahead. We don't want to be behind this, chasing it. We need to be out in front of it, kind of knowing where we're going to go, I think. And that is my opinion. And I do hope, thanks, Robin. And I do hope that as we are doing that work, you know, I'm, I'm going back to, again, just, you know, repeat, um, having a senior and a junior at G. Ray Bodley, they've been much more affected by the current situation the virus and now also the budget issues. And I just hope that the decisions that we're considering um, or the proposals rather that are, are being considered that we take into account that, you know, some students have already had a diminished experience as it is. Um, and I hope that we, you know, that with that can be factored into where, you know, if we have to make budgetary changes where that those reductions come from. Yeah, that's a great point. Obviously, you know, we have to keep as balanced a program and, and balance as opportunities for all our kids as possible. And, you know, when you see some districts, um, you all get NISPA Eclipse, you'll, you've seen, I'm sure, the articles where some of the, the larger small cities have started to, they made reductions in staffing already. Um, and I think for any district, when you're starting to do those things, Every single staff member in those in those in our districts are a part of our safely safely reopening. So every time you take an impact, um, that's affecting the your ability to 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 follow your reopening plan and um, meet all the assurance required by the Department of Health and New York State Education Department. So I agree. Yeah, Robin, what I was going to say is we will be coming back. Um, that's where I was starting early October. Obviously, we're going to be watching, but we're going to reprioritize that list uh, that we can share um you know as far as um just what would be some things that we'd be looking you know may have to look at but if you remember last year we cut you know we, we made some pretty lean we went pretty lean this is one of the leanest years um we cut 2.248 million um from our budget um our taxpayers um thank you for supporting us uh that obviously helps uh, each year, um, and we're we're going into a very challenging year that all of the school districts in the state. But uh, as as um, as uh, Kathy alluded to, you know, it's going to be important that 20% is very different. For there are districts that have a 70 73 million dollar budget, just like ours, and they have only they only get six million dollars from the state of New York, and the rest is all local share. Whereas in Fulton. We are $50 million on state aid and, and, and the remainder in local share. And so that's a huge discrepancy, difference. So 10, 20% of, of us is $10 million. We're 20% of a district that has the same budget but, but doesn't, isn't dependent. Um, for them, you know, 10% would be 600000 so $1.2 million. And if we have similar um, reserves, which you would because it's based on percentages, right, 4%, their reserves are going to last a whole lot longer uh, than ours, almost 10 times as many. Um, and so I think that's where the importance, I was pleased to see the state is bringing that up. I saw our acting commissioner also brought that up the other day, the importance for New York State Education, uh, what brought up the importance of making sure that it's not just 20% across the board to all districts, but you have to look at a differentiated approach because, um, that it means a lot, it's a lot different for us than it is for, for some other districts. And every district has their own unique um, circumstances. Brian, I wanted to add to that too. Back in, over the summer with NISPA, I was in a meeting with Senator Schumer and he had discussed the Sierra Bill that he had, that had been introduced. And I was very hopeful at the time that, that we'd be able to get funding that way. There was a large amount for education and COVID recovering those COVID costs. And I keep checking weekly. I checked it this morning and it still hasn't moved. So it doesn't even look like there's any hope at this point for that funding to come through at the federal level. Um, so we have to be very cognizant of that moving forward. Yep.
good point. And I believe, is there any other questions? I We went through the, the third part of tonight's presentation um, with res was respect to the um, the COVID purchasing, but we, we did the COVID purchasing. We kind of went out of order a little bit. Are there any other questions with respect to the financials? So we will come back at the next meeting or at the latest, the one after that, um, with a plan to share with you with respect to just as far as a, a continuum of different things that, that could be considered as we just prepare ourselves, because um, I think that's the key, is being prepared and being well thought out, trying to make sure we have as much information as possible, while making sure that we're doing, we don't, we've got to make sure that we stick to our, every aspect of our reopening um, as well. So there's a lot of pieces here going on at the same time, but the financials, um, again, are, are going to be a, a, a new and unique challenge. Um, for us and, and all districts in the state. And uh, we will continue to work closely. I think one of the things we have to also focus on, which we didn't talk about it, is advocacy. You know, and, and I know sometimes, you know, does it fall on all the years that, that it needs to? But I think it's something that I've learned over the last couple of years, um, being part of Fulton, uh, is that, um, and, and we also had that in my past district as well. Um, how do we band together? Um, with other districts. How, I think the small cities writing that letter was a good step. That was something that um, we pushed for as well as other districts, um, feeling that that was important that that the association wrote a letter. I think it's important that other organizations, um, whether it's the NISCUS, NISBA, NYSET, all, all of the different groups are working together collectively to, to best advocate um, to try to, to address um, these challenging times. And it looks like it's not just going to be 2021, but it looks like it's a, a three to four year uh, issue based on what you see coming out of the comptroller's office as well. It's still on that. I think it's around is it between 61 and 64 billion dollars, I believe, is still what's being projected. But um, at the latest memory that I have, but so over the next four years. And with that, that's the conclusion of the superintendent's report. If there are no other questions this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, would someone move <clears throat> item 4.01, please? Move, move it. it. Second. Discussion? This is Perry, I am a yes. <laughs> okay. This is Mr. DeGilorm. Yes. Mrs. Cooper? Yes. Mrs. Lyons? Yes. Mrs. Albacore? Yes. Mr. Cordon? Yes. Item 5.01, please. Move, Move it. it. Second. Discussion? Mrs. Perry, I'm a yes. Mr. Uh, Cordon? Yes. Mr. DeGilorm? Yes. Mrs. Cooper? Yes. Mrs. Lyons? Yes. Mrs. Albagore? Yes. Action 5.02 is a review of policies. We have a first reading of a number of policies. Is there any discussion on any of these? Going once, twice. Moving along, item 5.03. Some of that. Second. Discussion. Have we gotten any guidance on um, APPR, Brian, to know if, in fact, we know what is happening this year? I think you're muted, Brian. Oh. Yeah, I am. <laughs> Ms. Geidner, could you speak to that just to provide an update of our work, please? Yes, we, we have received guidance that at this point we're proceeding with APPR plans and there is opportunity to make changes through um, a resubmission or variance. We have had APPR work groups um, as part of our reopening process and plan and are proceeding um, with our APPR plan currently as it's written. We still have some work to do on SLOs, but the unscheduled and scheduled observation at this point are going forward with the same rubric that we have been using um, and our process will begin on September 30th. 
Thanks. Mm -hmm. Any other discussion? Mrs. Perry, I'm a yes. Mr. Cordown? Yes. Mr. DeGelorme? Yes. Mrs. Cooper? Yes. Mrs. Lyons? Yes. And Mrs. Albagore? Yes. Item 6.01. Move it. Second. Second. Discussion? <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> Any discussion? Mrs. Perry, I'm a yes. Mr. Cordell? Yes. Mr. G. Jalarm? Yes. Mrs. Cooper? Yes. Mrs. Lyons? Yes. Mrs. Albagore? Yes. Item 7.01. Move it. Second. Second. Discussion. Mrs. Perry, I'm a yes. <clears throat> Mr. Cordell? Yes. Mr. G. Jalarm? Yes. Mrs. Cooper? Yes. Mrs. Lyons? Yes. Mrs. Albagore? Yes. Item 7.02, please. Can we discuss that? Well, yeah. First, can we move it? <laughs> you have to get it moved first, and then we I'll can. I'll move it. I'll move it. I'll second. Okay. Now, discussion. And um, do you want to ask a question, or would you like Mr. Polvino to speak to it first, Mrs. Lyons? I'll, I'll ask the question. Go uh, ahead. I've had numerous phone calls today about this, so I just would like a few things um answered i guess people are wondering where the money's coming from um and i see today you did send us definitions of the title grants could you please explain where the money's coming from and what duties will be happening can't hear you <laughs> so can you hear me you can hear me now correct Okay, yeah. uh, thank you for the question. Um, under ESSA, and this is gonna come out of Title IIA, and what this is, is that um, it authorizes uh, progress towards improved teaching and leadership through professional leadership at the state and district levels. And specifically, it's used to increase academic achievement of students by improving teachers and school leadership quality. I believe this is a $195,000 grant. We have a, t a coach and a half on there already. So that tells you that majority of that grant is already used for um, paying the salaries of one and a half of our coaches. And if you recall, we have how we reduced our coaches this year. And we tried to get all of our coaches out of the general fund onto grants. So that's there. There's a small aspect of that grant and it probably be no more than $15,000 max to, to do this position. And it's it, this per diem. The per diem rate is based on that person's final average salary, what we did. They've already, she's already done training for our aides and monitors, our substitute teachers. It's a question that actually came up at a previous board meeting. How would we be training substitute teachers? And I believe we did a half day session, two half day sessions actually. Um, and um, prospective substitute teachers went through that and that went through all of the COVID uh, trainings and all of those different things to be a substitute here, she did that. We actually went through our lead evaluator training. Those are the types of things that she'll be supporting as well. Those are required by statute. We have to go through the lead evaluator training each year. And that's to talk about that consistency, that we're looking at the same things. Also, the training for the new teacher mentors. In other words, our new teachers have mentors, but you have to do training for the teachers who are doing the training, providing the services as a mentor. So it's, it's training for the mentors who are going to mentor new, new teachers. That's a lot of mentors, right? But again, that's how that works. And then the other piece um, that the person is doing is obviously with the transition um, on our senior team, um, I'm transitioning in uh, both Mr. Lisi and Mr. Carroll into their roles. And you know, um, you don't realize what you, you had until you don't have it anymore. And so she's aligning all of those different roles and responsibilities. A lot of things that are that come up as school gets going in areas, and she is providing that mentoring to both of those two individuals. So you can you heard me say there's a limit because there's already that that grant is extended, 
Um, and that's where we are, are um, we had a, a small block of money there. So it's on a grant and it's on a 2, 2A, which aligns perfectly with the work we're doing. And it's limited by the fact that we already have multiple um, salaries on that as well. Thank so you. That's, for a that. daily, that's a daily rate, Brian. And how many hours is that for? So you mean on a daily rate, what does per diem mean? I know what it means for me, but I don't know what it means for her. How many hours is that? It, per that's day? a full day. So a seven hour day. Okay. Yep. Brian, who With a duty you... free lunch. <laughs> so if Miss Connors is coming in and doing this training, it begs the question of who's doing this before? Why do now we have to pay for this training to be done? Well, in the past, we wouldn't have actually done as much training. This is all the extended training for the aides, the monitors, um, all of those different trainings around COVID. Um, she helped us with it, as well as the APPR as an annual. In the past, um, we've worked with, like, for example, last year, I actually went to a training, my training, um, one of my trainings, I had to go down and I joined the Onondaga County superintendents at a training. You try to find trainings at BOCES and things like that. That's what we had done. And we had also brought in uh, city BOCES had trained our principals as well uh, last year. So we've used a couple of different methods um, through that, but there's some more trainings that are involved this year, specifically around the aides, the subs, and obviously the the, um, the transition of two administrators. So 50% of my team is new um, this year. So I think that's an important to get out of the blocks, but it really it's the equivalent of less than 20 days um, in the end. Okay, and I just have to state for the record because it's a fair criticism of the district is please um, it you know it will be noted that we had prior budget eliminated coaching positions within the district for you know mentoring and things like that and now Mr. Connors is coming in so I just have to state for the record that it is a fair a, mm -hmm. a criticism that I am at least aware of sure. Understood. We try to keep it. Be a, it'll be a minimal expenditure. We'll not exceed that amount. So we'll keep it there. But obviously, you're right. You're right. We cut four positions uh, for coaches this year. We moved everything onto the grants. So it's a good question, Miss Lines. Thank you. Are we all set? Any other discussion? Okay, Mrs. Perry. I am a yes. Mr. Cordon. Yes. Mr. G. Gillorm? Yes. Mrs. Cooper? Yes. Mrs. Lyons? Yes. And Mrs. Abagor? Yes. Item 7.03. Move it. Move it. Second. Any discussion? Mrs. Perry, I am a yes. Mr. Corgone? Yes. Mr. G. Delorme? Yes. Mrs. Cooper? I mean, yes. Mrs. Lyons? Yes. And Mrs. Albacore? Yes. Mrs. Perry, or Mrs. Perry, geez, excuse me. <laughs> Item 7.04, please. Move it. Second. Discussion. Mrs. Perry, I am a yes. <clears throat> Mr. Gillar? Yes. Mr. Cordon? Yes. Mrs. Cooper? Yes. Mrs. Lyons? Yes. And Mrs. Albagore? Yes. 7.05, please. Move it. Second. Discussion? Mrs. Perry, I am a yes. Mr. Cordon? Yes. Mr. G. Gillorm? Yes. Mrs. Cooper? Yes. Mrs. Lyons? Yes. And Mrs. Abagor? Yes. Item 7.06. Move it. Second. Discussion? Uh, yeah, I have a question. Yeah. I thought we were cutting 10 hours a week out of the aids, and uh, now I see that we're hiring new full timers. Just wondering what we're, how we justify that. Yeah, Ms. Geithner? Yeah, the positions that we have hired full-time for, you'll see we also have had some leaves and resignations. So they're not creation of new positions. They're filling positions that were vacated 
that we um, need for the operation of school. Have you had any interest in, if, with uh, um, current part-time employees interested in full-time positions? Some, I believe, have, yes. That's something that the buildings are all canvassing regarding those opportunities. Okay, so if we've had, if, are any of these current part-time employees? At least one of them was a current part-time employee. I'll have to verify. I know at least one of them was. Okay, thank you. Any other discussion? Mrs. Perry, I'm a yes. Mr. Cordon? Yes. Mr. DeGilarm? Yes. Mrs. Cooper? Yes. Mrs. Lyons? Yes. Mrs. Zondergore? Yes. Item 7.07. Move it. Second. Discussion? I'm a yes. Mr. Mr. Cordon? Yes. Mr. DeGilarm? Yes. Mrs. Cooper? Yes. Mrs. Lyons? Yes. Mrs. Elbegor? Yes. Uh, board forum. Uh, Mr. Cordon. Okay. Um, I want to thank Mrs. Parkers for joining us tonight um, and changing her plans from whatever she was doing. And I want to thank um, Sam May for being present, being a voice. Um, and his leadership last week from what was disclosed this evening. And I did want to say still that, you know, I am sad for our fall student athletes. Um, I want to thank the community that was engaged and we've heard from. I think um, it's meaningful to hear from, from the community about what's on their minds and certainly guide us in decision-making that we have before us. Um, and I want to thank the students and the parents in that process. Um, we heard I know I heard from several um, and many emailed the board and I just want to I want to say thanks to them. Um, on a different note, I'm wondering, are our BOCI students, I'm hearing that BOCI students may not be able to use our Chromebooks for BOCI's classes like New Vision. Maybe there's an app that's missing. Does, does that mean they have to have another Chromebook from City to do that work or um, how, how does that look for our kids so they have access without having multiple devices. We're working and through that, uh, that tonight, but if you don't, if you have an sure. answer, but I, I just am, I'm just wondering about that. If our kids are, are all able to do, get what they need. Um, and I want to thank the staff, of course, for working so hard. I know um, with all of us, you know, it's still, you know, it's, it's hard to wrap your mind around all the changes that we've had to embrace um, with this change in model. Um, but I want to thank them all, and I'm looking forward to understanding from my students, um, or from my, my children, rather, who are students, um, just exactly, you know, what their week is, is looking like, is like um, as the weeks unfold. And, uh, and one last thank you to Mrs. Perry for all you're doing to keep us connected. Thanks. Okay, uh, Mrs. Abelgore. Yes, um, I too want to thank Mrs. Parkers for jumping right in. Um, one question I did mean to ask her was what the movement of the um, uh, hallways look like in between the few classes that they they do um, move through, because I know we try to keep our kids pretty um, much in the same spot. So Sam, is that something that maybe you can just kind of enlighten us on? Like, how do you feel uh, the movement in the building is when you're there? Uh, seems to flow pretty well. It doesn't seem like any kids are trying to not follow the procedures that need to be in place, but it seems pretty fine to me. So seems good. And there's not like too many, you don't feel like there's too many of you all in the same area. I feel like it's good. No, it's also good that there's a lot of um, people in the teachers in the hallway during like class time. So if you like have to use the bathroom, they're right there to take you to the bathroom. Okay, awesome, thank you. Um, and I wanna thank Mr. Els as well, as well as Sam for all that they've been doing um, on this subject of the sports that re really is heartbreaking for, for all of our um, students in the community. But I, I am very proud. I did get to listen to some of the kids last week um, 
And they were very well spoken, um, very respectful. I had heard from community members that they were very respectful when they were down on the, on the field as well um, during school last week. Um, I, I'm just so glad that there's something being worked out for them that keeps us kind of in alignment with our reopening plan, keeping our kids together, but also uh, keeping them going in um, their endeavors as well. But I do want to point out that we also need to continue to look at our other extracurricular um, student body as well. Um, and, and maybe I did hear Mr. L say that he would be opening up some of those intramurals to other students. So maybe perhaps would that be um, some of our non-athletes that would be able to join that? Or are you sticking to just our athletes doing the intramural um, section of what the kids will be doing in the fall? So, um, <clears throat> excuse me, the uh, intramurals or even the open practices we're doing is open to all students. So we're, okay. we're not allowed okay. to exclude to say you're not allowed because you didn't do this. Um, it, any of our activities will be open. Okay, that, that is good to know because I did, I did miss that, but I just wanted to make sure. Um, so thank you for all your work, Mr. Ells and Sam yeah. um, with that. And if you can keep us posted on, on how that's going and how that's looking, um, that, that would be really, really great. Um, I think I had one more thing, but um, Mrs. Lyons touched on the Chromebook sleeves. I think that that might be it for now. So thank you very much. Thank you. Mrs. Lyons. Um, I want to really thank the community for stepping up to the plate um, starting last March with helping um, adjustments with everything we've had to go through. Um, you really have done a great job. Um, I love the fact that since this has all happened, that the community has been involved in our school system. We've had so many people tune in to our board meetings. Um, communication, I've had tons of it from all different people asking questions about different things. I've been educated a little bit more myself um, with a lot of different issues that we have um, have been facing. Um, I can't thank our administrations, our teachers, our support staff enough for the hours they have put in um, to work this all out. Everyone, thank you. And Brenda, you said most of everything I wanted to say too. So I did. I do remember what I was going to say, if you don't mind. Um, it was the plug for, and I did bring it up last week with the kids because I'm super glad that Sam is back with us. Um, uh, we want to consider that junior and waiting voice on our board as well. So maybe if we can um, put a plug out there to Mrs. Parkhurst um, on top of everything else she's doing <laughs> um, to get our junior in waiting to for our student voice representative. So just to comment on that, I normally normally don't comment, but if I'm recalling right, and I get lots of emails, but I believe I saw an email that she sent to a group of juniors that had put in their names for that. So I believe the process has started. It was specific to being the rep, the junior rep on the board. So I believe the process has started, Ms. Albaboy. Okay, thank you. Mrs. Cooper. Um, thank you. I wanted to start with a question, and I'm not sure if Mr. Els or Mr. Palvino can um, follow up with me. I'm told that if a student is exhibiting symptoms and they need to seek the COVID-19 um, mm -hmm. test, I'm told that the state isn't allowing the rapid COVID-19 tests and that it has to be an actual test. Is that true? I just want to make sure we can let parents know which test is appropriate, whether it's the rapid one, if that's acceptable or. Yeah, the, the rapid one is, uh, is acceptable. Okay, great. Thank you. Perfect for clarifying. Okay. And then the um, other thing I just wanted to touch on was um, what many of my colleagues talked about tonight. Um, I I want to say, say that I've heard some of the criticism from the last board meeting, which is fair. Um, the biggest I regret is the student's voice and the lack of the student's voice. 
Um, you know, I apologize. It certainly wasn't intentional. Um, I know we've spoke to Sam and we've apologized as well. I just wanted to make sure publicly, um, Sam, that you knew it wasn't anything intentional. We recognize, or at least I recognize, how important that student's voice is. Um, and I want to publicly also thank Mrs. Abelgore who fought so hard to get that seat um, here. We're one of the very few districts that do it. And I think that it's probably, honestly, the most important seat that we have on the board is that student's voice. Um, and I was lucky enough to go to the meeting on Friday and I have to say I was just amazed. And I don't even think I should have been amazed because I know how great our students are, but just to see those students there as leaders, um, see them reaching out to all students, not just the students in front of them, all students virtual and the hybrid students, was you know really inspiring and to hear the students say that they're the ones who want to lead this discussion they want to be a partner they're stepping up to the plate with solutions it's really amazing to see firsthand everything that they're doing and how they are partners in the district and how lucky we are to have all of our students so thank you so much for that and that's it mr dj dj Lorne. What's left to touch on? Thank you, Sam. It's always important to have your student input. Thank you, Mr. Ells, for your lead with the COVID and as athletic director. Um, thank you to those who've answered my questions this evening. I appreciate that. Thank you, Mr. Lisi, for your tech support, getting Mr. Carroll back up to speed. And I'll turn it over to you, uh, Robin. Okay, Mr. May. Um, just wanted to say thank you for giving me and my colleagues a chance to turn nothing into something and provide support for kids that need it. Um, everything everyone said tonight is very much uh, felt by myself. Um, Sam, I, I appreciate very much your comments just now. Uh, I, I know it's not the ideal but I want to again commend you and your peers for stepping up to help find a solution. It's I know it's not the where we want where you wanted to be, but that you stepped up and you worked with us means an awful lot. And and my heart uh, felt thanks to every one of you um, for for showing leadership. It's uh, very much appreciated. And hopefully we can do better going forward. That is the intent. If I heard nothing, um, I got out of what I heard or read. Um, there's things we can improve upon and I believe that we will work to do that and we will work to communicate better and try to lay things out better for the future. Uh, we learn from our mistakes. Uh, at least I like to try to, I don't like to repeat mistakes. So where we failed in communication, I want to do a lot better, and I, I want to uh, be less um, uh, upsetting to folks. So that, not that, and that's not to say people are not going to like everything. That they will like everything. It is to say that um, I don't want people to feel like they were taken by surprise. And so we will work to that. And I, I talked to Mr. Polvino. I believe that we are in agreement on that, but I won't speak for him. He can speak to that. I think he already did though. So uh, we have a other work left tonight and I don't want to take much more time for that reason. But again, my thanks to everyone for their reports. Again, my thanks to everyone that tunes in to pay attention and find point uh, to my cop that my colleague, Mrs. Lyons made. We have much greater participation. That is the uh, silver lining in virtual meetings. Never expected it, um, but it's welcome. Congratulations uh, to Sam also. Yes, congratulations, Sam, on your uh, choice. And I, I again, I know you will make everyone, your, yourself and your family proud first and foremost, but just know that this board and this community um, is very, it's very proud of your achievements. Thank you. All right, um, if there's nothing else then, um, we are going to uh, convene to an executive session. So if someone would move item 8.02. Move it. Second. Any discussion? So let's take a five minute break and come back for the rest of our work. And uh, hopefully Sam will see you at the next meeting. And uh, Thank you.
Keep us posted. Do we have to vote? Thank I'm, you. I'm in favor. Yep. Do we formally vote? Yep. Uh, yes, I'm an I. I'm a yes, Mrs. Perry. <clears throat> okay, Mr. DeGilarm? Yes. Mrs. Cooper? I'm so sorry. Yes. <laughs> Okay, did I get everybody? Dave, I think yeah. we're good. Yep. Okay, see you in five minutes, folks.
All right. Um, move item 8.03, please. Move that. Move that. Second. Second. And any discussion? Okay, raise your hand if you want to get out of here. Go to bed, relax. One, two. I'm not seeing. Okay, Nick, I can't see any. Uh, yeah, I got your raised hand. Okay. Uh, Lynn, are you raising your hand? Yep. Okay, Brenda, I can't see. You're frozen. I'm raising my hand. Okay. okay. Frozen. All right, we're all good. <laughs> So it's it's uh six zero zero. Yeah, ten thirty one. Ten thirty one. Thank you very much. I hope you all sleep well tonight. Thank you for the hard conversation. All right. Good night. Have a good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.